Hey everyone, thanks Kat. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'll, I'll take that as confirmation and I would happily let you answer any questions. <laughs> Full faith in you. I am going to uh, share my screen and uh, share a PowerPoint with everyone. Thanks for joining us and hope you all had a great week. Enjoyed your holiday for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And be here, share my screen. Oh, you're going to have to give me rights to share my screen, Kat. But if you have any problems, I can email you the PowerPoint real quick. While we are working out technical issues, like there always okay, are, I will um, just let everyone know um, before we get started on budget. I wanted to say, say a few things, um, a few other updates in the area of COVID. As we all know, uh, the numbers continue to rise and put pressure on um, the system from all areas. So, a huge thank you to uh, those of you who are. Um, working and providing care right now. Uh, we know the stress that you're under and um, just wanted to put a reminder out that Station MD is available and we've heard from many different individuals that their experience is sometimes a four to five hour wait at the emergency room. So we certainly don't um, want any of our individuals going to the emergency room unnecessarily. Uh, so just wanted to remind you that we have that service out for all waiver participants, uh, their families, and the uh, caregivers that take care of them, um, paid or unpaid, and they can utilize the uh, 800 number or the app and uh, make that phone call and talk to a doctor who will um, help them through the process of understanding what's needed, um, can do GAP prescription refills. Um, and, and any other, uh, answer any other questions and coordinate with the emergency room if that is in fact needed so that they understand the individual is coming um, prior to them arriving and uh, we don't have a situation where they're stuck in a waiting room for a long period of time. So I included information on accessing Station MD and how easy it is in the presentation. Um, also, just wanted to say that they use that link if you need to find out more. Um, you don't need an authorization ahead of time. Um, you can just call um, the number to start up services or use the app. The, um, oh, and I have rights to share now. Thank you so much. All right. And Kat, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen? We can see it. Okay, wonderful. Okay. And so that there's a link right there. Um, you do not have to seriously take notes as I talk today. There will uh, be links to a lot of the budget information that I'm going to talk through, but then there will also be, um, we'll post the, the PowerPoint for everyone to have access to as well. Um, the, the other thing in the realm of COVID, a couple of other things, um, there were some Supreme Court decisions that came out last week. And um, so what that means is that, um, our providers who had, our home and community-based services providers who had been um, a part of the OSHA mandate because of having 100 or more employees, that um, over the decision to overturn um, no look to the, that no longer stands. Um, so the other um, CMS decision, um, which does affect um, facilities licensed um, as Medicare or Medicaid receiving that funding. Um, we do not have any change in our guidance for our staff at this time, and um, we are awaiting further guidance from the administration, and we'll keep everyone updated as that information flows. But just wanted to let you know 
uh, about that. Um, also, because of the high rates, we continue modified monitoring, um, and that is approved through the end of February at this time, and we'll make a decision regarding March as we get closer to the end of January and have more information about where we're at in the process. Okay, so budget update. So you've probably seen that the, I think we had a question in the chat but I can't see the chat because I'm sharing my screen. So, um, oh yeah, I can, here we go. Yeah, we had a question um, regarding um, the decision was overturned. So um, basically um, there, and I'm probably not using the correct wording, but there was a challenge to the OSHA mandate um, for 100 employers with 100 or more staff. Um, to require vaccination or testing, um, and the Supreme Court decided that that um, they agreed with the challenge, so that OSHA mandate no longer stands. They did not agree that OSHA had the authority to uh, require that. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, me and my legal, why well, I'm not an attorney. Uh, okay, so early supplemental. There's links in here to some information uh, for you. Um, so that's House Bill 14. And when you have heard about uh, in the news, the pay plan for state employees, um, that is in the early supplemental. And that is includes a um, pay raise up to $15 an hour um, as a base wage, no one in the State workforce would make less than $15 an hour, um, as well as a 5.5% increase across the board. And it also includes some funding for um, compression that would result uh, as a, as a uh, implementation of the $15 base pay uh, went into effect. Um, so the governor's request was for that to uh, be implemented on February 1st. But of course, the timing of that depends on, um, first of all, the, the approval depends upon um, the legislature. Um, and that has been uh, in both the House and Senate uh, budget and appropriation hearings. And they're moving forward with that process after hearing testimony with making decisions. Um, also included in that bill is um, items like Medicaid expansion, um, funding for um, the schools that uh, needs to be appropriated. So um, we will keep you updated on the uh, information as it comes and it goes through the process over at the General Assembly. So on Wednesday, January 19th, the Governor Parson had his State of the State address at 3 p.m. Hope you were able to tune in. Um, and he released his budget recommendations. So um, there is a link there that will um, take you to an overview of the budget recommendations for Department of Mental Health. It's about five pages long and includes kind of an overall look as well as um, about a page of bullet points per division talking about uh, the new decision items within the budget recommendations. There is also a supplemental um, bill, which is the full regular supplemental, we'll just call it the regular, um, and that is House Bill 15. Um, that typically passes around early April. Um, for us, that includes overtime compensation and uh, various uh, authority, federal authority increases that were needed. Um, for example, there was a CHIP authority increase um, and ARPA testing and mitigation authority increase. Um, there was also um, a mobile crisis planning grant. There needed to be some federal spending authority for that, or there needs to be. And 
Um, also included in that is a uh, some federal authority for expanding access to COVID-19 vaccines for our population for the DB Council. And so, again, you can get the full details at that link on the supplemental, and we will provide updates as we go through the process. The fourth bullet there is what will be the, the budget book for the department and give full details regarding the budget rather than the five page overview at the second link. Um, that has not been posted for our department yet. I think social services and office of administration is out there and um, they usually post that in the order of kind of who is testifying first over in the house budget. Um, so ours should be up really soon. Um, Department of Mental Health has the um, house budget hearing on um, next Wednesday morning. So now we're gonna walk through the recommendations um, for new decision items that was that were included in this year's budget recommendations. So one of the largest items and something that is very exciting um, to everyone on this call because we know about the access to care um, issues that have been in our system and the workforce crisis causing that. Um, there is 411.6 million for standardized market-based provider rate increases. And so what this does is, um, if you look at those sub-bullets, there is um, 375 million of that 411.6 million is fully um, provider rate standardization. It takes all service types and brings them up to a baseline level um, where the market has a starting DSP wage of $15 an hour, and it really aligns with the, the pay plan for state employees that was also um, recommended by the governor. Um, so this would um, be a significant increase for um, all of the service rates, which is, is really needed for access to care. And then there is an additional 36.5 million in there to um, go towards value-based payment. And I'll talk through that in more detail, um, but we've been talking about this with everyone, our stakeholders and our staff about moving towards a system of value-based payment. And um, so this, we're very excited to see these recommendations come into uh, play and have the opportunity to move the system in order to reward quality and, um, and the providers who are investing in, in providing quality services. Before I talk about the actual um, details of what is included in the value-based payment, I wanted to kind of take a step back and talk through what, uh, what really does value-based payment mean? What is, what is a modernized value-based payment system look like. So there's really some uh, key factors that need to be a part of your system in order for you to have value-based payment in place. And so this is a, a picture of on the left side, each of those key factors and kind of where we're at in the progress right now. And then on the right side of the screen is post implementation of the initiatives within this year's budget is where we'll be on our progress towards a value-based payment system, which is very exciting. And so red is, we haven't implemented that yet. Um, orange means it's in progress and green is implemented. So seeing all that green on the right-hand side is very exciting um, as we've been uh, doing research and in planning and work towards this for um, at least since 2017, but probably going back further. So one of the things 
let's talk about the two greens that we have right now. Um, I mentioned that we had done a lot of planning and research, including uh, technical assistance with uh, CMS, and um, most recently, a lot of um, participation and partnerships from our providers and our IT vendors and our case management agencies in the LEAP grant on the IT side. Um, so the other green that we have is acuity-based payment, meaning that um, there are um, rate allocation score levels um, that we, uh, previously it was the SIS and now it's the MAS that we use to determine um, someone's acuity level of need. And there is a payment that is higher um, based on that higher acuity level or higher level of need. Um, so, uh, for example, in the other long-term care services uh, systems in Missouri, there is not an acuity-based payment model as of yet. And so when we did planning for value-based payment, we were really working with the other agencies that provide home and community-based services and long-term care, including health and senior services and the uh, Department of Social Services with the skilled nursing facilities. And so in looking at their systems, acuity-based payment has not yet been implemented in the home and community-based services for um, senior and disability services or for the nursing facilities. So that's something they'll be working towards. Um, but for our population, um, that's something that we have in the green. Um, in the red there on kind of moving clockwise, um, you really have to have baseline wages and a stable workforce uh, in order to move forward with value-based payment. You can't be treading water and implementing quality best practices. Um, nobody, nobody's got time when they're putting out the fires um, to do that. So um, that's one of the, the key factors. Uh, you have to have standardized rates. Um, we are in progress on that one. Um, the most recent budget year, uh, that the one that we're in currently, we had an appropriation for uh, the residential rates to be standardized. And that is so that's in progress, but we do have, of course, now uh, this year, a rate study for all service types from Mercer. And so we will thank you to the many providers and partners that have worked with us on giving feedback during that process. It is not sexy, it is tedious. And, and very difficult. So we appreciate your time in working towards that. Um, the standardized rates, because you have to have everyone at a baseline level in order to start rewarding for performance and increased quality. Um, otherwise, um, if everyone's at a different level, um, those quality payments aren't as meaningful to someone who's at a lower level and just needs to get up to the baseline. Um, so that's another piece. Um, Data for outcomes and performance. Uh, this is really key. We have some, and you'll see this in the next slide. So we have some initiatives where we already have performance data outcomes and we're able to uh, uh, organize payments around um, what leads to those good outcomes. Um, in other cases, the value-based payment means that you need to start paying for the data collection um, that's really the beginning, and uh, the first year or two is collecting that data in order to understand um, what, what type of actions uh, as a uh, provider delivering services lead to um, good quality outcomes, cost savings, things of that nature. Um, the data for performance and outcomes is probably perpetually in progress because you want to be updating and improving at all times. Uh, IT infrastructure, we are in progress there as well. That's also something that you want to see as consistently in progress. And um, that is because IT is always changing and modernizing. Um, so on our path here, uh, we want to see that uh, lead to a system where both the state system, uh, the case management, the case management agency and provider systems 
are all able to um, have interoperability and transparency. And so uh, that is something that we're striving towards with the funding that we have received in the budget recommendation. So moving along, um, now that we're kind of at that baseline, is um, let's talk through some of the incentive payments that are included in the value-based payment. Um, so I talked earlier about there are some things that we have data on um, already on the performance outcomes. And uh, one of those is tiered supports, um, implementation of behavior supports. Um, and so one of the initiatives is an incentive payment on a quarterly basis to providers based on the level of implementation for tiered supports. Uh, as, as a tiered support agency. And so um, we know we have a lot of providers who have already implemented tiered support and seen great success. Um, they see costs and time savings on their side. Um, the unfortunate thing is that many have not been able to implement yet because it does take such a significant time investment um, from the team at the agency to implement tiered support. And so uh, we had Mercer conduct a, um, an analysis and uh, document the cost of, of the time to implement. Uh, and so uh, depending on what level of implementation you're at, uh, there will be a quarterly payment uh, to support the time that is invested by the agency and being a tiered support agency. We really want to encourage everyone to move to that because we see the outcomes, not only the savings for the provider, um, but also we see um, really improved outcomes and the risk levels for uh, individuals receiving care. The, one of the next initiatives is remote support. Um, so the plan here would be to implement a separated waiver service for remote support outside of assistive technology and it would increase the limit um, of the amount that could be spent on remote support to allow for those very sophisticated systems that um, can have an individual have increased independence. And for us, this would uh, be implemented as a shared savings program. We know that there is a reduction in the number of individuals who um, need to provide care when remote supports are put in place. And so it's a positive impact on, a, on the direct care workforce. And it is also a savings to, to the state. Um, there is, you know, possibly one, you know, one shift or more um, per day per individual that's not being covered. Um, so the, the model here proposed would be to calculate that savings uh, at six months in, six month intervals for um, those who had implemented and the, uh, the state would uh, provide a uh, portion a portion of the savings in a payment to the provider who had implemented remote support. Um, so uh, that we're really excited about. We are technology first, and we believe that um, those who uh, put in the work to invest in uh, technology and increase independence uh, deserve to um, share in, in the benefits of that to the state. The next is electronic visit verification, and this is um, a payment for um, the personal care providers who are connecting to the EVV aggregator system. And um, so this is going to lead to data being available at the Medicaid level for decision making. And so um, that, uh, that will be a part of the, the incentive payments that are proposed. And kind of the next category of of what we want to see in the value-based payment is we want to see, um, we have a real uh, focus on workforce recruitment and retention. And um, we know this is the biggest issue that um, everyone is dealing with right now. 
Um, so there is some funding for enhanced training to be built. And basically uh, what this looks like is the, uh, the purchase of the NADSP, the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals, um, the three levels of NADSP training to be placed in the Reliance system where all have access to it. And then there would be incentive payments uh, at different levels for agencies who invested in the time for their employees to be trained um, with that enhanced training that was available. Uh, because we know that well-trained individuals take better care and have uh, individuals have better care outcomes when there is enhanced training. So, but we also know that um, People want to be rewarded for the enhanced uh, le the learning that they do um, and taking on those additional responsibilities. And there is a cost to providers for the time that it takes for those individuals to uh, receive the training. So uh, there is a proposed 1% rate increase at three different levels for agencies. Um, and level one would be that 100% of your employees have that level one training. Um, and then there's kind of a, a level two, which corresponds to uh, about 50% or more of your staff are level two trained. And that would be a 2% rate increase overall um, on top of the other rate increases that were in place. And then uh, level three is kind of um, that next and final level of you have 50% or more of your, your team who are level three trained and above. Um, and there's some uh, requirements in there for how long the individual has been at the agency. And um, we know that um, we wanna get uh, people trained quickly. Um, so level two starts at um, anyone who has six months of experience um, and the level two training. And I believe level three is 18 months, but um, I will check on that and we'll have, of course, more details as we go along and more detailed fact sheet. Um, the next initiative is the direct support professional apprenticeship incentive payment. And many of you are aware, we've been talking about for some time, the DSP apprentice uh, partnership with Department of Labor that Duane has been working on with many of you, and uh, this is getting ready to roll out um, after final approval from Department of Labor. And uh, we want to reward the uh, agencies that are hiring these DSC apprentices and um, ensure that this is seen as a, a really viable talent pipeline for individuals who are looking to go into an apprenticeship program. And so um, this would be a, an incentive enhanced payment and to help pay for uh, the raise that is required um, after a certain milestone is hit within the apprenticeship program, um, but also for participating in the data that needs to be collected as a part of that. We also have um, some funding for a career ladder initiative. And this is really aimed at looking through the different training requirements for each of the um, types of services and the agencies that authorize them. So um, it's, uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that um, the training at DD is not the same as the training for an aide um, or a DSP um, who works for um, services that are authorized through Department of Health and Senior Services. And then um, there's separate training to become a CNA and there's separate training to become an LPN. And um, so this is really aimed at creating career ladder um, an initiative where um, we would have stackable training and we would really analyze what um, content in each area matched and working with the different agencies to say that um, if you have this training over here, 
then if you, you move over here, you don't need to retake that training or possibly if you're trained in this, then you're also certified to work in this. So kind of making it um, a more mobile uh, training uh, that individuals can take with them as they move throughout their career in, in direct care and providing care. Okay, continuing for value-based payment, I mentioned earlier, there's some things that we don't have data on or all of the data that we need. Um, so one of the things that um, we want full data on is the uh, staff stability survey information through the NCI survey, um, which provides us with information and so many of our providers are already completing this um, on their own time because they see the value in the information that is provided. But it's information on wages, uh, retention, turnover for staff, and uh, we will have an incentive payment for the National Core Indicator um, survey completion. We want to have that um, across the system, and that will lead to baseline measures for future value-based payments. Um, we know when there's a lower turnover, we have better client outcomes. So um, that'll be discussions that we have forward uh, that we have as we move forward in the future based on the data that we have. Um, we want uh, an incentive payment for the health risk screening tool completion. And this is really aimed at getting a baseline um, look at the overall uh, health of the individuals that we serve, what their health risk level is, and using that to develop new value-based payment uh, initiatives and incentive payments for uh, rewarding the, uh, the lowering of someone's health risk level through um, certain activities. So that's the data that we're looking for there. And then we are also looking at an incentive payment for the employment reporting data, um, because we do want to move to a model of value-based payment for employment, um, for those that are finding employment um, or, or training to um, independence um, quickly and, um, and doing a great job at, at finding employment. So um, that will be part of the pay for data, baseline data um, in the VBP initiative. And then the uh, other piece of the uh, VBP budget line is information technology. And this is all about interoperability, as I mentioned before. So it will include um, payments for provider system enhancements and to get them to a level where they can connect data. Um, it will be to help fund uh, connections with the health information exchanges for provider systems and enhancements to the connection system in order to um, be able to process value-based payments um, that are a little different than paying for 15-minute service units or, or uh, daily service units. So that is the, the type of initiatives that are included in the IT funding as well. One of the other bullet points that you'll see in that summary document of new decision items for the department is the $14.7 million of federal funds to enhance and expand the HCBS program. Uh, this is the HCBS Enhanced FMAP, but there was also HCBS Enhanced FMAP funds for the value-based payment items as well. And um, you'll see that the enhanced, the enhanced FMAP is really being used at uh, targeted towards the intentional use of one-time funding initiatives to enhance the program, whereas all of the rate increases are funded utilizing GR in, in ongoing funds. And so we don't create a system where we need a replacement um, general revenue new decision item in the future for those ongoing rates. Uh, in this, you will really see uh, a look at increasing the quality and um, training in our program. And there have been numerous 
at CMS requirements increased in the recent years regarding quality assurance and the health, safety, and welfare, which is wonderful. Um, and we want to make sure that we as an agency are following those guidelines to ensure the health, safety, and welfare, and including those for transparency in initiatives like a provider scorecard. So there is that piece in here. There's also training on risk mitigation and due process and uh, rights uh, also included in the QA piece. And there is an increase to the cap on home modification service. So we want to uh, raise that limit uh, with our uh, with a modification to our service to say that we know that the uh, cost of home modifications has greatly increased as construction costs and the overall um, cost of living and inflation has gone up. Okay, so this slide really shows um, what I like to refer to as what is happening this year already that is being funded with a temporary funding source. And we really need to move to a, re, um, a secure ongoing funding. We need general revenue to continue these. So the first one is the um, replacement general revenue for the um, residential increase and standardization that happened this year. Uh, the second item there is the um, continuation of the enhanced FMAP that was used to target rates in the personal care program. And the third item is to um, have ongoing funding for the uh, Station MD Health Assessment and Coordination Services. Okay, this item here is about the cost to continue the program. And it is $127 million total with $43 million of that being general revenue. The utilization increase that you are familiar with seeing in the budget process is uh, the anticipated and projected individuals who will be entering the waiver in this coming year. And so you can see the numbers there based on our projections for the number of new individuals coming into the in-home and residential waivers. This also includes a cost to continue. So. Um, separate from new individuals entering the waiver and needing services there and making sure that we do not have a waiting list. Um, this is for individuals that are currently receiving care in the waivers and over the years there has been an increase in their care plans and their needs for care. Uh, and this has kind of been building over time and is really a good thing um, if you look at it from the perspective of individuals with BD are living longer and they're staying in the community longer. And so um, that also means that we have a utilization increase for those who are currently in the program. So 38 million of the 127 million is for the cost to continue of individuals who are currently receiving services. A couple of other things that are in the budget that are pretty exciting. Um, well, FMAP's not exciting, the FMAP adjustment's not exciting. Plus that first bullet is exciting. So there is 4.7 million um, for the autism centers. This doubles the budget um, for the centers for autism and really uh, takes it aim at reducing the waiting period for diagnostic evaluations and services for family. Um, let's see, and then there is, yes, yeah, a very exciting FMAP adjustment that I think there was a 0 0.01 decrease in the federal match for us this year or this coming year. There is also a request for federal authority uh, for a, a vaccination uh, funding received by the DB Council uh, to assist individuals in our population with accessing the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and then there is a continuation of the state employee pay plan that is recommended 
in the early supplemental, as well as um, that smaller bullet underneath the continuation of the 2% pay plan that went into effect um, at the beginning of this year. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen um, and just see if there are any questions. that there was a question about um, whether we can send this information out afterwards. Absolutely, we will be posting it on the website. And um, Emily answered a question regarding the waiver manual and other the question regarding um, whether the CMS vaccine requirement applied to home and community-based services providers. It does not, um, so that has been verified on, um, by CMS during phone calls, but also in writing on their website. And, oh, Emily already answered that, so I'm just repeating. <laughs> Go down and, hey, Kat, why don't you throw out to me something that um, has not been answered? Let's go with that. Um, this is Emily. I can um, give one to you. Would the incentives be a one-time payment to the provider, or would this be a reoccurring basis on a reoccurring basis? So the incentive payments um, are dependent upon the initiative. And so, um, for example, the uh, tiered support is something that is ongoing. And so the plan is for that to be a continuation. Um, the uh, remote support and the shared savings in that, the state would have ongoing savings and we would want to share in that ongoing. Um, so the uh, recommendation is that for that to be ongoing. And um, then uh, the pay for data um, is really uh, more of a time limited um, incentive payment. Um, we would pay for the data that we received this year and then determine whether uh, we would uh, need more data in order to develop baseline measures and um, incentive payments based on a, a type of um, activity or milestone completed. Um, so uh, really dependent upon it, whether that's paying for the outcome or uh, paying for the data. Good question. Okay, um, what was the extension date for the modified monitorings? Um, the modified monitoring is currently extended until the end of February. Does the autism funding affect EMAP, Eastern Missouri Autism Project? It affects the um, Missouri Centers for Autism which um, I have not been here long enough to know those off the top of my head. And we'll look that up very quickly. And I can tell you um, that it is based upon the um, current waiting list and where people are waiting at. And the amount is appropriated per center based on those waiting lists. So let me check that real quick and find the document. Okay, it looks like the Thompson Center out of Columbia. Um, so these are the um, Centers for Autism. So the Thompson Center out of Columbia, um, the Knights of Columbus out of St. Louis, Children's Mercy in Kansas City, Mercy Kids in St. Louis, SEMO in Cape Girardeau, and Washington University in St. Louis. Good question. I'm sorry, we had another one and I just lost it. Oh no, it's okay.
I have one that I see in the chat. For employees who are credentialed through the national DSP, will they qualify as apprenticed? That is a great question. So, uh, Dwayne is currently working with stakeholders on the apprenticeship uh, program uh, content in the training, and it's being modified to um, fit the NADSP modules. So we will have a breakdown once he completes that on um, what level of completion someone will have when they have gone through the apprenticeship training and the level one training and kind of vice versa. And we expect that there might be some level two trainings mixed in there in the, the apprenticeship requirements um, and I'm not sure if every single level one would be within the uh, apprentice requirement. So more to come on that, but great question. This one kind of follows along that same line that you were just talking about, and you may have answered it already. Would staff do the NAP NAPSTA level or the DSP apprenticeship, or could they do both? They seem to be almost identical. They are almost identical, and so we'll be figuring out just a little small intricacies um, and defining those for everyone. Great question. Um, I think I see a question about uh, going back to COVID. Is there a place that we can find N95 masks? Um, so, yes, if you're having um, any issue with obtaining masks, um, please reach out to um, our, I'll post the email address in, in the chat so that you can email the right email address here at the division to address that. And I think I'm getting a lot of feedback that I may have stated the wrong day on modified monitoring. So if anybody wants to jump in and I'm looking at the, the memo right now. It wouldn't be a good day unless I was wrong about several things, so. Okay, it looks like we sent out a revised memo on November 29th. Is that the latest one? Did we not post the latest one? Go to email blast. in the chat that somebody said we have not received the modified monitoring updated memo. I have signed it, so we will find it and get it out today. I apologize for that. Good to know. Just wanted to, just wants to clarify, Jess. Um, they said, you just want to clarify modified, modified monitoring is, is extended to the end of February or the end of March? Which is it? <laughs> I believe the um, memo I signed was until the end of February. You're correct. Yeah. Yes. On January 13th, I signed it said it was extended to the end of February. So we will get that sent out today. Thanks for hanging tight with us. We have another, it says to verify that autism funding will not be for the PAC projects, but rather for the actual centers. That's correct. The recommendation within the, the governor's budget is for the, uh, the diagnostic um, waiting list at the uh, Centers for Autism. And if we're good on questions, 
then everybody gets Oh, I see something about the federal public health emergency. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the federal public health emergency um, was extended on uh, January 14th, and um, it is extended for 90 days. And so we have updated our COVID flexibility charts online, um, which gives us the authority to the public, federal public health emergency gives us the authority to continue with the flexibilities that we have in place. And um, so the flexibilities and exactly when they expire, um, some of them within the Appendix K are six months um, following the end of the federal public health emergency. And those that have authority within a disaster state plan amendment or an 1135 um, agreement with CMS, those expire upon the expiration, the actual day of the expiration of the federal public health emergency. Um, and you can find all those details in the COVID flexibility chart that we have posted online. Exactly what is extended until when. If a TCM wants to do by next testing, can we order those kits through you? Yeah, so that would be um, through the uh, Department of Health and Senior Services request site. And if you have any issues, you can um, email our testing uh, email address. And there seems Emily, to be a little, little bit of confusion, Jess, on the um, monitoring again, the modified monitoring. This is sorry regarding the modified monitoring again. We received an email on January 14th that stated modified monitoring is extended until April 14th. Can you clarify? Yeah, so the, uh, the January 14th uh, announcement was that the federal public health emergency was extended. And so many of the flexibilities that we have the authority to do um, that have been modified um, are the um, are extended because of that until April 14th um, or six months following that. Um, the modified monitoring is separate um, from that. It's something that we make a decision on based upon the current um, spread of, of COVID and the, the rates in each area or statewide. And so uh, the modified monitoring is, is separate from the federal public health emergency being extended. And that is currently extended through the end of February. However, you all would not know that because we have not posted the updated memo. Emily, if you're real quick, and can find the um, provider testing email address to stick in the chat. That one can be used for both the um, questions about testing and um, about obtaining PPE. Um, we have one that says, so we can take so we can continue to use Relias for testing, both, cert both certifications and recertifications? Correct. Yeah, that was included. Any specific plans for ARPA funds for this department? So that is something that I have not had time to analyze yet, but we can include that in the next coffee chat. Um, it's in a separate budget bill, and um, but I do know there are some specific um, Department of Mental Health items within there. Um, I want to think off the top of my head and say that um, they are not specifically related to um, but there are some that overlap regarding um, the population of duly diagnosed um, with uh, MIDD. So um, we will uh, include that in more information 
uh, the next time that we talk and an information that we send out and appreciate the question because yes, there is a separate budget bill um, for the ARPA um, with the exception of the targeted ARPA funds um, and the enhanced FMAP is an example of a targeted ARPA fund in that it can only be spent in a very specific way um, at a specific agency for a specific program. Um, so the targeted ARPA funds were included in the department budgets while there's a separate ARPA bill for the, um, for the funding uh, that is able to be used a little bit more um, flexibly throughout the state. And um, yes. I'm not seeing any more questions, Jess. Um, Emily did put the COVID flexibility chart link in the chat, by the way. And I, I am not sure where that, oh wait, I might've just found it. Oh, uh, thank you for sharing what your two and a half year old <laughs> is doing, Robin. That's so sweet. <laughs> I think um, I've got that I, right. I think we're I looking for the right. Testing. Yeah, getting tested, testing resources. Yeah. Okay. That's the one we need. That's the email address that you can reach out to if you have any questions about PPE or testing and um, our wonderful group with uh, Kim and Leslie and Trisha will help you out with those and get you to the right place. Um, I no longer invite my two and a half year old to be anywhere, well, she's three now, to be anywhere near my computer during video conference calls because Angie and Julie Peterson um, had to witness her mooning the, the webcam. So they're forever scarred. Sorry about that, and thanks for continuing to work for me. All right, everyone have a wonderful uh, weekend and appreciate all that you do um, and look forward to working together to advocate for all of these great initiatives in, in the budget process. Thank you.